give a shout out at the few upcoming events and opportunities that we're involved with um, and they're revolving here on the slides. Um, the first one is on May 18th, there's actually a med tech event happening over at Plexus, which is a new co-working space um, right by 30th Street Station. John Epstein from Medicine Faculty Why, why are all these agencies interested? 
Why do they care? Well, when you start to talk about privacy, it brings in a whole crowd of, of, of regulators who are interested. And the attorney generals are interested, and state attorney generals are interested as well. Uh, when you talk about patient safety, it brings in a whole crowd of regulators, and the FDA certainly is an important stakeholder there. But with mobile medical applications, it, it really is a storm, perfect storm of both privacy interests and patient safety interests. And that's why it's such a crowded regulatory field. And it really is hard to get through a day. And you know, I probably should have put up you know, Penn, Penn's recent uh, research instead of using Hopkins. I didn't really modify properly here for, for this particular presentation. Really, you know, researchers around the, the country and the world, academics, startups, big, big uh, medical device companies, and pharmaceutical companies, you can imagine, let's say, in the insulin space, are interested in how they can touch their patients, how they can get more accurate data, how they can devise devices and, and medicines that may treat the specific issue of getting very patient-specific data. So it really has become everywhere, um, whether it's you know, Google is involved. I mean, it really is hard to, to find a, an entity that's not trying to enter this space right now. Um, on the issue of privacy, health information is uniquely valuable. So we all hear about the hacking that goes on, whether it's Target, and certainly there's been some hospital and healthcare institutions that have been the targets of, of hacking and, and, and privacy concerns. But privacy data is worth well more, Some one study said 20 fold more than financial information. It is uniquely valuable, and protected health information in particular has, has value. You can learn more about the individual for social engineering to get into their lives uh, if, if you have protected health information as opposed to maybe just some financial data. So, so I said there's a crowded regulatory field and we can animate this a little bit. Um, and we have, you know, what we have FDA and OMC and believe it or not, the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, has an interest if you're certainly doing geolocation. If you're transmitting over the airwaves, there's, there's regulation and interest there. The Department of Commerce has set out standards um, as, as well as to their expectations on privacy. And the risks really go any which way a lawyer can imagine, um, whether it's direct financial impact to, to a company, potential litigation, obviously regulatory risk, uh, reputation damage, and the like. So the, the risks the companies are entering this space um, are, are not small, and they're, and they're varied. Um, I mentioned um, a moment ago that there's been some recent developments, and there's a series of guidances that have, that have come out, um, and, oh, I don't see the site on it, I can get you the site, but, uh, oh, what's that? Just down at the bottom. Oh, it's the bottom, it's tiny, I see. Yeah. So on FTC's <laughs> website, and by the way, if you're interested in the slide, just let me know, and we'll share them. Um, you have to have them, there's some source information and resources <coughs> as well, and if you have questions, we don't get through all the slides, it's going to be just fine, too. Uh, but the FTC, in, in collaboration with the Office of Civil Rights and with FDA, put on their website, in tiny little print apparently, at ftc.gov backslash tips advice business. Anyway, if you just type in mobile medical application at FTC, you'll find it ready enough. And it's an interactive tool that will go through some of the issues at a high level that we're going to talk about today. And on that website are 10 questions uh, that start to probe at what agency really is uh, most interested or involved or perhaps the regulatory lead in looking at an issue. So if you, if you were able to see those questions from the back, hopefully, you know, the first four all target, is this a HIPAA issue? Is this a privacy issue? Are we talking about protected health information in the first place? Just because it's protected health information doesn't mean HIPAA necessarily applies. You know, it's a question of, of the use of, of PHI through providers of health care, perhaps their business associates. So it's not, well, we have protected health information, HIPAA must apply, but it's sort of the first question. And, and from that first question, it becomes some important learnings if, if you are a wannabe or hope to be or maybe already app developer that's going to be in the healthcare space. Are there any in this room that are in that category of hope to be or wannabe active? Okay. Um, so when you're, when you're developing your mobile apps and you're thinking about collecting personal information, and just ask yourself, do you need it? Do you, do you need a birth date 
when a year would suffice for purposes of your functionality of your device. Because if a birth date is not needed, but a year date is sufficient for whatever purposes you're developing, that helps you answer the first couple of questions. No, we're not collecting PHI, among other elements of what's protected health information. The fifth question really goes to whether FDA is involved and whether FDA cares. It's because is your app intended for the use, diagnosis of disease, or other conditions, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease? And that all that is right, that those words right there in item number five, and I can go over it in more detail, is really the definition of a medical device that's regulated by FDA. So if it fits within that category, you are making or creating a medical device that's created by, uh, that's regulated by FDA. And it'll really boil down to what you say your device can do, what claims you make. And if you take away just one point from today, and only one point, it really centers on what claims are you making? What are you saying your app can do? What are you saying uh, about the, how you're protecting the privacy of the information? Because it's your public statements about the app which will largely govern your regulatory risk around whether you're a medical device regulated by FDA and whether the FDC even cares. <coughs> So the next question, does, does, does your app pose a minimal risk to the user? Is your app a mobile medical app? I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more when I d uh, dive a little bit deeper into the FDA regulations. But those two questions are also getting to, okay, even if you are under that definition of medical device that I just went through, does the FDA even care? Because if it's a low risk to the user, uh, you may be under, well, technically a medical device, but the FDA is saying, you know what, we're not going to be regulating you in the same way, and that's a very significant issue there. Um, a nonprofit organization, that will lead to a, a legal question as to whether the FTC cares, nonprofits outside the scope and reach of the authority of, of the FTC. And then again, um, you know, next questions are really going back, back, back to get more of those things. Okay, so let's talk again. So talk about the FDA. Okay. So again, a medical device, is anything that fits within this definition. And really, it, it boils down to the claims that you make. Are you saying that you can cure, mitigate, prevent, or treat disease? Really, if, you, if that's the claim that you're making, well then you are gonna fit within this technical definition of a medical device. But, FDA has, has noted, and, and, and uh, let, me, let me take a step back. So you're regulated by FDA, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot. First, you have to figure out, well, are you a class one, class two, or class three device once you are a device? And the classification will dictate how much of the regulatory environment will apply to you. If you are a class three device, the highest risk device, you support sustained life, for example, um, they will require a very robust regulatory package and FDA approval before you're going to be permitted to sell the product in the United States. If you're a class two device, and you fit within what's called a 510K designation, the submission process and the regulatory path is, is much different, it's, it's much easier, um, it's much quicker, and you're, and you're dealing with whether your product meets a substantial equivalent factor or regulatory definition, basically being able to say, well, you know what, we function similar to other devices that are on the market, and here's the proof of that fact, rather than trying to prove that your device actually is safe from applications. So that is a big difference between class two and class three devices. Um, class one devices, just, just by way of example, would be a tongue depressor. It's used to treat disease, it's a low risk device. There's not a lot of regulatory hurdles to get a, a, a tongue depressor on the market, but nonetheless, there are certain regulatory requirements even for uh, a tongue depressor. So if the regulatory environment applies, if you fit within the definition of medical device, and if uh, FDA, is, is a regulator uh, that will control your activity, there's a long list of obligations. And starting with establishment, uh, registration, you have to register your, your place of business. There's a host of labeling requirements that are needed. Uh, the pre-market submission, which I just mentioned, could be a full pre-market application with clinical trial data, or it may be something less than that. Um, there's quality system regulations that govern how you manufacture and your manufacturer quality controls. Um, 
there's medical device reporting obligations for all devices if there is an adverse uh, event, a reportable adverse event with your device, and then a host of postmarking obligations too. So what do you take from this? If you're creating an app and you step into the FDA regulatory environment, you're stepping into a lot. You're stepping into a, a longer path to be able to commercialize. You're stepping into a lot more expense and having to develop it. And it's just something you have to factor into how you're considering the, your, your, your commercialization goals. Okay. So last year, February 2015, FDA issued a guidance. And it's online, and all the FDA guidances are on FDA.gov, which is actually a pretty user-friendly website with a lot of information about what they regulate and what they don't regulate, and what these classifications mean, and very specific applications uh, for their regulations. And one of the guidances that they put out last year was just on this topic. And what they recognized was, you know, even like my Fitbit might fall within the, the technical definition of a medical device. And you know, maybe Apple has really good lobbyists, or maybe um, you know, FDA just took a very sensible approach. But low-risk devices that are not really used for complex uh, physician decision making, the FDA has basically said, you know what? We're, we're, we may uh, technically be able to regulate you, but we're going to take a pass on that. And it really is going to be what you say the app can do, and what is the effect of the app. Is it going to be something where, let's say, treatment decisions are going to be made based upon the outcome of some algorithm that you're putting on a watch that could harm the patient, or is it just counting my steps and my calories and I can help use to inform the patient? Low risk not really treating disease outside the scope of what FDA intends to regulate. So will FDA regulate your iPhone? And the answer is, anyone? A flashlight on your iPhone, will FDA regulate it? Who thinks they will? No one, okay. Who thinks they won't? Who just refuses to raise their hand? <laughs> Fair enough, all right. Uh, the answer is, it depends. Because the single takeaway I want you to leave today with was, it depends on what you say the app can do. If you're saying it can treat eye disease, and, <coughs> and, and, and or at least help a doctor you know, look inside your eye, um, well then, if that's how you're promoting your product, well, there's medical devices that do that, um, and that are regulated by FDA, and so will you be regulated by FDA. I wish I came up with this example, because it's a great one, but <coughs> FDA came up with it. So it's not really, I'm not really allowed on a limb here to suggest, you know, this is how they're going to regulate. Okay. All right, so what's, what's some examples that we've seen? Even long before uh, there was this guidance, there was some examples. So there was this U-Check app that helped um, facilitate a urinalysis. So it would use the camera on, on the iPhone to work in conjunction with the testing machine to help read out um, and, give, and, give, and give results. And the FDA said, you can plug it in. Told the manufacturer will work like oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You know, that the, the mobile phone used to analyze the dipsticks whole as a function as a function as a whole really works as an automated strip reader. And in that in that way, it, it is a regulated device. So even using an iPhone in conjunction as an accessory to an existing medical device can render a medical device really depending upon what you say the mobile phone can do. Okay. So the FDA will regulate not only the medical device, but also medical devices that control other devices. Medical devices used as an accessory to medical devices. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're using it as a monitor or a remote monitor for an operating room. Well, guess what? Well, now your, your, your phone's also a medical device as well. Patient-specific analysis and patient-specific patient treatment Recommendations really are going to drive the determination of what FDA will care about. What don't they care about? Or at least what they said they don't care about right now. They're not looking to, to, to regulate the Fitbit and other tools that are out there to help organize health information. They're not looking you know, to, to regulate other tools that help you go to your doctor or help your doctor, if that's you, um, interact with your patient. They're not looking to regulate simple calculations, things that are really well established, and all you're really doing is using this app, you know, in lieu of you know, a 
pencil and paper, let's say. Um, and you know, they're really not looking to regulate in this setting physician portals and ways to uh, interact <coughs> through the EHR. Okay, so some examples we've talked about fitness, fit, and BMI calculators is an example of a simple, a simple regula regulation. Um, web portals is, is another example. Um, beyond FDA, there's other regulators though. And there's FTC, which Michael's gonna talk about, F FCC, which I've mentioned as well, and of course HIPAA and HITECH uh, dealing with privacy information. Um, in addition to all that, if that's not enough, state consumer protection laws uh, also could possibly apply for the same reasons that FTC applies. So when Michael's talking to you about the FTC, just keep in mind and I, that, that each state, in addition to this entire federal regulatory environment that I just mentioned, has their own set of laws. And if they don't have a specific regulation on topic, they have a broad consumer protection law that basically says you should not engage in anything that's unfair, deceptive, or misleading. So going back to my main point, if you make claims about your product that could be deemed uh, deceptive or misleading or unfair, and Michael can tell more about what that means, then you have a whole host of state attorney generals that also care about what you're saying. So understanding the risk in looking at what FDA cares about, how generally accepted are, <coughs> is the information that you're providing? Um, how well accepted is it? How pervasive is it? How complex are you really dealing with? Or is it something that's really more challenging? I mean, if you're doing dosing for cancer patients on your iPhone, they're gonna care. Um, if, you're in, if, if you're engaging in some type of conduct, let's say, and there's an example that Michael will run through that the FTC cares about, <coughs> that let's say is tracking the color and size and shape of the mold and the size of the melanoma risk that's involved. Well, again, you know, you might not go to the doctor if, if your app is telling you that it just looks just well and good. That's just the stuff the FDA cares about. Is it going to cause patient harm when the app fails or when there is some, some misuse? Okay. Um, I talked about, about privacy a little bit. Um, FDA actually is now involved and cares about <coughs> cybersecurity of med mobile medical applications. I don't know if there's any Homeland fans in here. Anyone? Homeland? No one? Okay. So in Homeland, there was a whole thread about the vice president being basically being killed because his case maker was hacked into. And everyone sort of said, well, that's kind of far-fetched, but except it's not. Um, and FDA cares about that. So in the design of medical devices, one of the components of your design team should be thinking about is cybersecurity. Because FDA is looking for that as part of, of um, the, the submission and whether the, the product ultimately is, is safe um, and effective. Um, a couple months ago, FDA issued uh, a, a draft guidance. And what guidances are by FDA, draft or otherwise, are their current position on a topic. A draft guidance is simply, here's our current position, but we want your comments before we finalize it. And sometimes they finalize it, and sometimes they don't, or sometimes it takes a long time to finalize it. But what industry does is relies on these guidances draft and final, to at least get the industry's current thinking on the topic. And it talked about what a company should be doing post-market. If you already have a product on the market, probably not as interested in this group right now, uh, what do you report, how do you report, when do you report, uh, any type of, of uh, cybersecurity concerns and issues as there's now guidance on that topic from FDA as well as FTC um, as, as well as others. Uh, what FDA has said is that we want a um, cybersecurity risk management program. We want to understand how you're going to detect uh, and respond to cybersecurity threats and what measures you're going to take ultimately to fix the patch and, and how you report it. Again, I'm happy to go into cybersecurity more if, if it's of great interest. Um, I think the take home here is it's really as part of both the design and the implementation and marketing of a product, cybersecurity is a relevant. Um, example of FDA enforcement action, uh, Hospira has an infusion system uh, which FDA, actually it was Homeland Security, had detected that this product was subject to a hacking concern. So when I talk about Homeland uh, not being too far-fetched, 
Homeland Security actually is looking for opportunities for people to hack into medical devices and cause patient harm. Uh, again, before, I'll uh, just go back one, but that's fine. Um, so even before there was guidance on cybersecurity, FDA put a little bit of a stake in the ground and sort of warned the public about the risk that so they issued a safety alert back in the summer of 2015 that notes the cybersecurity risks of this particular uh, particular uh, infusion system. And I don't know if you can read that or not. But ultimately, um, through hacking outside the, the system, there could be an opportunity for those to control the amount and dosage um, of, of product being infused, which uh, concerned FDA, should concern all of us, and issued this. Um, health warning. They didn't shut down the hospital or anything like that, but they, they certainly worked with the facilities to start transitioning away from this uh, vulnerable piece of equipment. Not something that you want to happen to your product, certainly nothing you want to happen to your patient of, of, of FDA issuing a word saying be careful, this is a dangerous product because it's subject to cybersecurity threats. <coughs> okay. All right. okay. Might be FTC? Yep. All right, so thanks, Barry. So I'm going to pick up and I'll discuss the Federal Trade Commission. One point I just want to note off the bat, so Barry was talking about how the FDA may apply it hereafter. The FTC absolutely is going to be in And part of the reason is the FTC sees itself as a bit of a super regulator. It's a very broad directive to really uphold and protect consumer protection in all product lines and product sectors. So, you know, while the FDA has a keen interest with drug medical devices, the FTC really has a comprehensive overview. And underneath that comprehensive overview, again, the same two, same two issues that Barry touched on, I want to just discuss from the FTC's perspective, which are safety and advertising and cybersecurity and data breaches. And so while these are two pretty disparate topics, the FTC actually holds their authority to regulate both in the same section of the same act, which is Section 5 of the FTC Act. So under Section 5, the FTC has a unfair and deceptive trade practices. So, kind of just want to unpack that a little bit. Uh, so, you know, what is an unfair trade practice? Um, so, it's kind of a amorphous, a little bit of a broad topic. Um, earlier definitions basically said something is unfair if it injures a consumer, has potential to injure a consumer, um, or is unethical or unscrupulous. Whereas in the cybersecurity context, which is where I'm going to focus on the unfairness problem, Courts and the FTC have accepted a new definition that you know an unfair trade practice could be failing to have reasonable or appropriate data security measurements that then lead to a resulting act breach and, and compromised practice. Um, so that's unfairness, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later on. Um, then deception is a little bit more straightforward. Um, it's basically you know what what you would think it would be. It's kind of a false or misleading statement um, that has the potential to really alter. So with that in mind, uh, I want to talk about uh, the recent FTC enforcement actions kind of directed towards the medical mobile app space uh, with two very similar apps. Um, so in 2012, two apps came on the marketplace called Mole Mapper, or no, sorry, Mole Detective and Mel App. Um, and both of these apps claim they could do very similar things. Um, they were subject to FTC enforcement at the same time and actually settled with the FTC in 2015. And so basically what they claim they could do is they could use photographs taken on your camera, they can take a picture of a mole, they're going to assess that mole's risk of becoming malignant. Um, and they'll also direct you when and whether you need to seek medical attention. So a little more detail, they actually would uh, classify the mole's risk or, or risk of becoming malignant as low, moderate, high, or no risk, and they use the same kind of considerations that um, you know that a doctor, a, a dermatologist would be looking at. So these are some screenshots from mole detective. And you can see, okay, on the left here, you know, somebody took a picture of this mole, and they're saying it shows no signs of melanoma, and you know, again, considering asymmetry, border, color, diameter, evolution. Now on the right, we have a mole that you know they say it's yellow, it's moderate risk, it shows some symptoms of melanoma. Looks like the color and diameter, you know, based on their formula, kind of be triggered on this. Uh, if they're getting rise to the level of a high risk, you know, be red, and it basically tells you, okay, you need to go see a doctor. Um, and so, what these both these apps are claiming they can do, in addition to you know this kind of analysis, 
their advertising, they said that they would increase the consumer's chances of detecting early stage melanoma, uh, which is a pretty pretty comprehensive claim um, that you know if you don't have really corroborating or, or underlying evidence to support, could certainly lead to some concerns of patient safety. So, you know, kind of fair to say, if I use this app, I have a lot of moles, I take a picture of all my moles. They all come back no risk. You know, maybe I decide I don't need to go see a dermatologist. Um, you know, same time if it's telling me when I need to seek medical attention, maybe I presume that if it never tells me, I don't need to go. Um, this is Mel app. It works very similar. That's this is the other mole, uh, mole, the other app. Um, and so those <laughs> those kind of issues were exactly what the FTC keyed on when they brought an enforcement action in February of 2015 alleging that both of these apps, these app developers were engaged in a deceptive trade practice. Because they were making these claims that their app would increase you know, consumer chance of detecting early stage melanoma. They didn't have adequate scientific evidence to support that. Um, so really what's interesting about this is the quality and really the quantity of evidence that the FEC said was necessary to corroborate this fact. Like they actually require these app developers you know, who are selling their product or Two and five dollars, I think it was, in the app store to do clinical trials, you know, well accepted, rigorous clinical trials, to basically prove that they could do, you know, what they're saying they were they could. Um, you know, they were also forced to repay any of the profits they made, um, and they both pretty quickly settled with the FTC. Um, and there was one dissenting opinion. The FTC actually uh, decides things for the commissioner, um, and one of the commissioners said. You know, I'm not sure this is the right thing. You know, we're kind of we're going to chill innovation by imposing this high standard on an app developer. You know, these are products that really serve a purpose. They're really bringing health information to you know communities that may not be able to get it for cheap. You know, we shouldn't be imposing these kind of requirements. But at the end of the day, that's what ended up happening. And you know, I, I do think um, you know it may not be an unfair result based on the, the far-reaching nature. Uh, but then just to contrast that, I think the end of 2015, Apple put out their research kit, uh, which has a bunch of different products that uh, are, are really intending to capture evidence and, and data about certain disease states. And one of them was mole matter, which uh, similar to the other ones, uses a camera on your mobile phone to gather data. But instead of gathering data to then make an individual patient determination and say, okay, this is, you know, you have melanoma, go to the doctor. They're basically just gathering this data to learn more about the disease state. Uh, it was data that you could share with your doctor. Um, you know, it constantly reminded you to go see a doctor. And so at this point, there's been no suggestion that either FTC or possibly even FDA is interested in regulating this type of app. Um, but What's interesting in their advertising, they're claiming that you know they want to use this service for long enough, gather enough data that hopefully one day in the future they can really make those types of claims that these other apps are making. Um, so you know, I think then once you get to that point, it's going to be that same kind of scrutinizing process where you know does your data match up with you know, what you're saying your product can do. So I think a, a real key takeaway and just a pair of barriers saying is um, you know the you need to ensure that there is data to support the claims that you're making, um, because if not, you know, you certainly could be subject to FTC regulation, regardless of whether you classify it as a medical device or a mobile medical app under FDA's definition. Um, so, you know, if you have some data, maybe you circumscribe the claims that you're trying to make just to support that, because I do think this is going to be a somewhat fact-intensive inquiry, where, you know, they require clinical trial testing for, you know, these two apps I just discussed, but that's probably partially because of the extent of the claim they were trying to make. Um, so that's that's really where the FTC has been with the deceptiveness problem under Section 5 as to medical mobile apps. Um, but they, they've been very interested in um, unfairness and cybersecurity. Um, so 2000, you know, briefly, as I mentioned earlier, unfairness in the cybersecurity context has taken on a different type of definition. It's basically mean, um, you know, if you're subject to a hack and you fail to provide minimal or appropriate data security measurements, the FTC can come in and, and regulate you um, under their unfairness problem. And so that 
that was really all settled in the Wyndham decision, which is uh, good law here in the Third Circuit where we're sitting today. Um, but in Wyndham, there was clear patient harm, clear injury. Uh, there was $10 million worth of fraudulent charges that resulted from these breaches. Um, but just to contrast that with the recent case, FTC versus LabMD, uh, which again here, it's a little bit different of a factual scenario. They had a billing computer that had some medical records and, and um, billing information, and they found out through a third party that LimeWire had actually been installed on that computer, um, and they promptly investigated and determined, okay, yes, LimeWire is on our computer. Somebody could have shared this information, but then found that nobody had actually downloaded the material, and nobody really had any records compromised and any resulting injury. Um, nevertheless, the FTC, I think, trying to see how far their authority is, brought suit um, and basically said, you know, there was a breach, you didn't have appropriate security measurements, you know, this is unfair. Um, and an administrative law judge, which is less presidential than a regular court, and this has been appealed, so it's a little bit of a caveat. He basically said, you know, there's no evidence of actual harm or a high likelihood of future harm, so there was uh, no unfairness. Um, and then briefly, I just wanted to touch on three key topics that the FTC has focused on um, that they basically say everybody should care about. I just want to plug three that I think are relevant to our discussion. The first, start with security. Um, you know, as Barry mentioned, don't capture, don't collect PII and PHI that you don't need. It's not necessary to the functionality of your app. You don't need it, and hackers can't take what you don't have. Um, and then number number eight, uh, there's a lot of making sure your providers implement reasonable security standards. Um, at the end of the day, if you work with a third party and have them develop your app, if there's a breach, it's likely you who's going to be on the line rather than the developer. So ensuring that you know they're complying with what it is you want is definitely very important. And then just quickly, number nine, put procedures in place to keep your security current and address vulnerabilities that may arise. Um, you know, cybersecurity isn't really like a one size fits all aspect. It's constantly new developments, um, you know, new ways to, to really breach and hack data. And with the FTC defining unfairness as failing to provide industry or, or reasonable safeguards, um, you know, that's that's going to be a moving target that changes over time. So just ensuring that you remain current and, and, and keep up with that is very important. Um, I just, since we only have almost yeah. 10 minutes left, we can wrap. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we have time for questions. And yeah, sure. So do you have any final points? Yeah, a couple of, just a couple of points. Okay. So this start with security. This was put out by the FTC. They said, we're going to take 50 enforcement actions and try to boil them down for people so there's some additional guidance. So again, this is a document you can access to see and get more detail on, on any of those. The other point I'll talk, and I've already kind of hit the main point, is the state attorney generals and regulation enforcement. Everything that Michael said about the FTC, every state attorney general would pretty much say they can do the same thing as well. And an important fact of, that may be a little bit nuanced for a non-legal uh, audience is that there is no proof of harm requirement them to come in. Um, the the, the LabMD case that, that Michael was talking about basically said you need some, need some likelihood of harm. In that case, the litigation had gone on for so long and still no one had raised their hand and said I was harmed. They said, well, you know what? After five years of litigation and hunting and pecking and looking for harm, FTC, if you can't find anything, well, then maybe there wasn't a substantial likelihood of harm. It's a way to peel back FTC power a little bit, but the takeaway here is that there doesn't have to be a single patient harm or a single breach for FDA or state attorney generals to care about this because the information, your privacy or your patient, or, or, or your privacy and certainly patient specific protective health information is important and, and regulators care about it. So, okay, that. great, thank you. And I thought I'd just kick off the discussion. Mm -hmm. So, that was a great overview of some of the risks or, you know, issues to avoid if you're thinking of developing, I guess, more of an app medical device. And a lot of folks at Penn are developing devices that actually go in your body. So you, you may want to talk about that a little bit. But yeah. in terms of getting, if someone is, there's a lot of app development underway here too. So do you have any easy rules of thumb besides, you know, come work with Pepper Hamilton to avoid <laughs> some of these, you know, 
Chris. No, I, I think yeah, there's, there's homework that you can do and should do before you necessarily pick up the phone and, 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 and retain a lawyer for that. I, I do commend the FDA website and their interactive tool which starts to flag some of those issues. For the non-app developers, for medical device developers, you know, certainly implants are regulated by FDA and there's a whole host of regulations and I, I listed a bunch of them um, as far as that, what that regulatory path looks like and mm -hmm. it depends on, on, on the device. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the slide deck, Michael subtly reminded me, we have a list of resources that we've put out there that are publicly available as well that go into each one of these topics in a little bit more detail. So, and we can, sorry, we can circulate that um, and put it on PCI's website. Um, and we're also, I should highlight, a, the first stop for anyone thinking about this here at Penn. And the director of our offices, both at the medical school and the engineering school, are both here, Vivian Martin and Pam Beatrice, so as well as a bunch of other PCI staff who are involved in commercialization of this here at the university. So I just wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's homework that you can certainly do. There's a lot of publicly available information. Ultimately, some of these decisions, okay, now I've refined this claim. Will it qualify? Won't it qualify? You're ultimately going to need an opinion on, on that if you, if you take you know, the decision to not inform FDA of what you're doing or you want to look to see whether the claim that you're making would subject yourself to FTC enforcement or AG enforcement. It, it's probably a good idea to check in on that. I mean, I met with an app developer last week who was trying to really figure out, he was really at the business development model. He, he has great ideas, he has a way to capture information, and he has to figure out which way his business is going to go. So we sort of walk through the different regulatory pathways and say, well, if you want your app to do this, and make those claims, here is what those steps are going to look like. If you want to take more of an interim approach, like the role application uh, as part of the Apple Research Kit, well then maybe it's a different path and you should be thinking about collecting data in more of an interim step. So there's a there's a big business function here as to what, what do you, what's your role and what are you ultimately trying to accomplish. Okay, and before I open up, I just wanted to clarify, when you're talking about claims, you're talking about consumer claims. You're not talking about patent claims. No, we yeah, I'm talking about what you're telling, consumer claims. Okay. How you're promoting the product. Great. So I have a question on that, uh, on the FDA example, the example you gave of the, the phone the flashlight, right? Let's suppose there's an off-label use and the, you know, the ophthalmologist decides to go and use mm -hmm. the uh, light on his iPhone as an optimal scope, right? In that case, does Apple have liability, or uh, is it just solely the, the physician that would have liability if something went wrong? Yeah, I mean, the liability is the question. I mean, the liability ultimately drives back to whether you were promoting off-label or not. So if the medical device manufacturer is it with a wink and a nod saying, oh, by the way, doc, um, you don't know me, but here's 10 phones that you may want to use you know, for the, you know, <laughs> there's a problem there. But you know, doctors, but FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine. So if doctors want to use an <coughs> iPhone in a certain way, and their carrier is comfortable with that, and it's consistent with uh, standard medical practice and hospital credentialing, um, FDA has no interest um, and no authority over the practice of medicine. So as long as it's not the medical device manufacturer uh -huh. promoting the off-label use. And then there's even a twist there because there's some a uh, very recent case law on off-label that talks about truthful, non-deceptive, truthful, non-deceptive off-label being protected by the First Amendment, and that could be a subject for another day if you're curious about that, or I can talk about it more now. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Any other useful tips that you want to leave us with? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I think really having the business plan laid out is what you're trying to accomplish if you're in the development path is the most important thing. What, what are you really trying to accomplish and what does that regulatory path look like? I think that's where I would, would, would focus because you don't want to sort of step into this and learn this somewhere down the road where someone's doing due diligence on your company or, and looking at it and saying, well, wait a minute, this is really interesting. This is great. Where's your FDA clearance? Where's your FDA? What's your plan? What's your regulatory path? I think this is stuff you want to be thinking about in the design phase of your business or the design phase of the app. <coughs> Great. Um, thank you so much sure. for coming out and telling
you for your time and attention. So again, we'll circulate um, the presentation. We'll make it available also on our website. And we'll be back in September with a new series of commercialization topics for our Lunch and Learns here. If any of you have any suggestions um, who are here at Penn and would like to contact us, feel free to reach out to me or Kat Kinkle, our um, Laurie Actman. Our emails are on our website, on the staff page, and very happy to um, have your input. Yeah. So. And I say Laurie has, has our access, she's on our, our mailing list, I guess, and uh, we do a, a breakfast uh, four or five times a year, Life Science Speaker Series. This was an adaptation of <laughs> one we did in April um, on topics. Uh, June's is antitrust for those who are in the generic uh, big, big pharma war issue, probably not a great interest uh, to this audience, maybe it is, uh, but certainly we can get you access to those topics as they come up because really a focus is on the life science uh, industry. Uh, we have lawyers that largely show up because we give them continuing <coughs> education credit. We have venture funds that show up because they care about what's going on in the industry as it may affect their investments. And then we have people that just want to come for free breakfast. <laughs> so if you're sort of country club and if you're interested, um, we have a non-competitive complimentary program if you want. <laughs>